Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I'm Rajesh Shisan Gupta and a warm welcome to all of you to this course on Indian art. Our course is titled Indian Art Materials, Techniques and Artistic Practices and this course covers a wide range of subject matters that starts from the Harappan civilization in the 3rd millennium BC to something that had happened very recently, the contemporary uh, art in India. So, among this, uh, all these other different kind of practices that we see, in them we have different kind of societal conditions, we have political changes, we have cultural aspects, all of them they have a huge role to play in shaping what we know today as Indian art. So, we will be discussing all these different aspects and we will try to give an overview of different kind of practices that had survived and flourished in the Indian subcontinent. So, first thing first, India is a country of great diversity. So, the in terms of the culture, in terms of demographic, in terms of geography, in terms of um, you know different kind of societal uh, practices, we see different kind of actions and practices that have shaped up in this subcontinent for ages. And that also adds to the tremendous amount of complexity as well as um, the richness of what we know as Indian visual culture. So, so, going with that, I think what we will have to understand it that we will start our discussion with the idea of India. So, when we say India in this particular respect of Indian art, we are not talking about the map of India that had been there after 1947. But if we are going back to 3rd millennium BC or then of course that I mean if we are coming back in time. So, we have the entire Indian subcontinent as the place where all these cultures and all these visual practices have flourished. So, when in the course I will be talking about India or the Indian subcontinent, I mean the entire subcontinent which are also inclusive of the present day nation states as Pakistan and Bangladesh. So, talking about the geographical conditions and then how the art had developed in these places. So, we will be looking at different uh, materials every uh, week. So, in the first week for example, we will be looking at clay. In clay, we will be looking at terracotta and terra cruda, those two kind of practices and then from there we will be looking at some of the other materials in the subsequent weeks. The reason for us to focus on materials and not on the chronology is to be more focused on what the materials, techniques and artistic practices offer us to have on our visual practices and uh, culture in general. So, for that reason we will try to understand how these material practices have shaped in the Indian subcontinent, how do we handle different kind of materials with our hands as well as part of our societal practices and artistic practices and then take those things further. In this respect, we will also look into some of the other materials for example, pigment. When we think about pigment, we think that how pigments are used in different kind of painting practices starting with the caves in Bimbetka to the Ajanta, Sittanavasal and so many other sites where mural painting had flourished. And so, we will be looking into the idea of pigment and from there we will be approaching the history. The same thing we can say about the use of paper, when we think that the arrival of paper, their impact on the visual culture, then how papers are produced how um, colors are produced and how uh, miniature paintings and different kind of manuscripts are made. So, through those lenses, we will be looking at 
how um, paper is uh, paper became integral part of understanding Indian art. So each week we'll have this one theme with which we will be approaching the material. So coming back to that, that what we'll be doing for our first module and that is on the site of Indus Valley. So Indus Valley sites as we can see on the uh, map that in the right side of the screen we have that the, the map of um, the Indian subcontinent and in the northwestern frontier of the Indian subcontinent we have the river Indus and the other tributaries and all of them they create this valley, the river valley which is mostly uh, fed by the, the soil that was uh, the sedimented by the river and then of course that is the valley, that is the river valley that was created by the river Indus and through which where a number of different sites had flourished over time. So when we talk about the Indus river valley and that also had some of the earliest evidences of what we know today as Indian art. That is the reason starting our discussion from the Indus river uh, valley is such an important part for getting into uh, or delving into our discussion on Indian art. So when we talk about the Indus river valley we do not just say the river Indus but on the screen on the map as we can see that there is the Indus river that, that flows through the northwestern frontier of the Indian subcontinent and from there we also have the northern Indian plains that reaches until the river Yamna and the river Ganga or the Ganges. The entire area we know to have flourished during the, the third millennium and the second millennium BC and the entire area is also the flood plains. So that is the, th those are the commonalities between the, the sites that we found in by, by the river Indus as well as some of the sites which are not so close to the Indus river but also considered to be part of the entire Indus valley. So in this entire place what we find that from the 3rd millennium BC at least from the 3rd millennium BC there are structured and very well organized cities that have started developing and from there we also see there have been tremendous amount of trade exchanges, import and exports and uh, different kind of uh, exchanges with the people in and around the region had taken place and that is the reason why in the Indus river uh, valley became such an important part of the Indian history. Now some of the important sites that we find in this river valley would be the city of Harappa and the city of Harappa which perhaps suggest the mature phase of the Indus river, uh, Indus valley civilization and that the city of Harappa we, we believe to have flourished between 2600 BC to 1900 BC and then we also have some of the other cities for example the city of Mohenjo-daro which is further south in the Indus river uh, valley and then we also have some of the other very important uh, sites so for example Dhola Vera, Rakhi Garhi and so on and Lothal. So some of the sites are now today in the uh, in the nation of Pakistan and some of the uh, sites are today in the nation state of India as we know. So what happened in this sites as we know that in the 1920s the excavation was started by the archaeological survey and from there we slowly started to have some of the sites uncovered as well as some of the pottery fragments and everything else that came into our observation. Now when talking about the art or the visual culture that had flourished in the Indus river valley, why we think clay is such an important part of it? The first thing first that the entire area is considered the flood plains that means the entire area was shaped by the river and by the river we also see that I mean there is an abundance of clay and clay not only helps making the figurines but it is also ha it, it also plays a huge role in shaping the agriculture which is 
indispensable for any civilization and at the same time clay is also used for different kind of building practices. So, since this is the area we are talking about it is in flood plains. So, we see there are different kind of canals those were created from the river for irrigation as well as for agricultural practices and the canals were also made for supplying water to different sites in the in the entire valley. So, this this uh, the canal systems and then the mud the, the mud that was collected from the river bank those are either used for making uh, forts or for making uh, different kind of city walls and so on. So, from there we find the importance of clay had been there ingrained in the material culture of this people. So, we do not have much of stone or the hard material the conventional material which are used for architecture building. So, we have clay in this area in abundance and that is the reason this is the material that was picked up by the people in this valley and they were utilized. So, talking about the use of clay we have two different kinds of use for the clay and that also suggests the two uh, the, the, the terms that I have used in the title of this module and that is terracotta and terra cruda. So, terracotta is the baked clay in which the items objects bricks and so on those things are made from soft clay then they are sun baked and then they are put in a kin for being baked. So, after they are baked they become durable much more durable and they are resistant to uh, water and uh, the weather conditions. So, that becomes ideal for making buildings and so many different other kind of um, you know material for, for habitation for, uh, for, for public uh, buildings and so on. So, on the contrary we also have something that is the unbaked clay and that is terra cruda and terra cruda is something that we find that in some places the mud walls are erected by the river the mud walls are created in the in the by the river for for uh, the embankments as well as for the city walls and so on in some places we also find that the city walls they are uh, 7 meter in their perimeters as as uh, wide as that and in, uh, in the other uses of the mud or the unbaked clay that we find and that is for uh, utilizing different kind of ritualistic pur purposes that is for utilizing different objects for ritualistic purposes. So, all those things we see them to be part of this uh, the cities those were created. Now, in the city of Mahenjodoro, which which had developed before the city of Harappa, if we see the, the city plan as we can see on screen. So, in this city we see that I mean it has a clear north south orientation and in this city we have that the existence of the city walls that we have spoken about that was made both from mud as well as from the bricks and within the city walls we have different structures and all those structures were started being excavated from the 1920s. So, within the city walls what all we see here are different kind of uh, this, this structures for example, the public bath, a stupa like structure, the image we have on screen in the right side that shows this stupa like structure it could have been some kind of assembly where the senate or the ruling government of the of the place they would deliver a lecture or to gather a public for different kind of purpose because we do not have any other evidence that suggests that these were religious structures. So, apart from this stupa, apart from the public bath, we also have the granary which is also a very impressive structure and also we have assembly hall and so on. And right outside the city walls or sometimes within the limits of the city walls we also have graveyards from where uh, the skeletons of the of the bodies those were buried during the Harappan period are excavated which also tells us more about the visual culture the material culture around this time period. Now, since the Harappan script had never been deciphered, so we are all left with the material evidences for example, the bricks and different kind of other objects those suggest that what kind of culture they had there, but we do not have access to their script. 
So getting a little in detail about the, about the structure of the granary, we see there was this impressive granary that was made in the city of Harappa and here the granary we see that is around 45 into 45 meters in its uh, 45 into 45 square kilo, uh, meters in its, in its uh, size and in this granary we see that there is a, uh, the, it, it is almost divided in half in two segments and in these segments we see that that there are uh, six uh, units in each side and those units we see that they have brick bases and on the top of the brick bases it is believed that the wooden structures were erected and that is how the entire granary structure was created. So granary is something where we find that the grains were collected and then they were kept for, uh, for the public to use. So that also suggests that I mean how the city might have functioned. In the city we also have a really uh, organized way of the drain system, the roads were also laid out in perfect grid like patterns. So there are roads which will run north to south as we have also seen the map of the city that has a very clear north-south orientation and then there are also roads which will run east to west. So the intersections of this important roads will be the crossroads and where they are also very much uh, important part of uh, addressing which, which structure uh, will be uh, erected where. So uh, that, that is how we find that how the, all, the, all the important st uh, structures for example the assembly, the, the granary and uh, of course the stupa, the public bath and so on, they are situated in the different parts of the city perhaps that also played a great importance in terms of understanding the, the importance of those sites in the Indus Valley period. Another important feature of the Indus Valley culture we find is that it is not monumental because if we are talking about the second, second millennium and the third millennium BC, around that time we also have for example the, the Mesopotamia and then um, Egypt was also developing around the same time. The Syrians they were also been uh, you know in, in their full glory at those times. However, we see that in those respects, in, in those regards, we find that in Egypt, in Mesopotamia and in Assyria there are very clear marks of the royal families who had ruled on those areas and that is the reason we find the monumental structures those were erected. For example, the pyramid, the stepped pyramids and different other palace complexes and so on. Unlike all of those places, we do not really find this kind of monumental structures in the Harappan sites. And that is something that came as a surprise. At the same time, it also perhaps suggests that there was a different kind of governmental system in the Harappan cities as opposed to the sites in Mesopotamia and Egypt and so on. And that also make people think about that whether there was um, a particular ruling family or there were um, elected members that they, they have ruled over these cities. So that, that, that also makes us think about the governance of these places and all these things have been made possible through the analysis of the material remains that we have from these sites. So for example, the use of the brick, the use of terracotta and so on. Now from there, we also find what is interesting is this, the use of terracotta and I will be getting more into the use of terracotta instead of terra cruda because terra cruda even though there are some of the suggestions that the mud uh, walls were used and perhaps uh, materials or the objects which were uh, made from the, uh, from the, from the unbaked clay or from mud those were existing in these sites but we do not really have much evidence because mud decays with time it can get uh, it can uh, deteriorate with with the with the existence of water and other uh, weather conditions which is not the same case for terracotta so i'll be getting more into uh, the the use of terracotta and all the tangible evidences that we have
So for example, on screen we have the two different images and the image in the left side we have there is a female figurine and there have been at least some 10,000 fragments of figurines. Those are collected from this Harappan sites, the Indus Valley sites and uh, till date. So, uh, what we find in these figurines, they, they are uh, pretty much small and humble in their shape and they, they are uh, modeled from clay for, for sure and so those are made from an additive process in which there are blocks of the clay and then they are shaped and then different kind of hands and the legs and different uh, you know the, the body parts and ornaments and so on those were made from different clay strips and they are added to the body. So this is the process that is called the additive process as opposed to something which is carved from a stone which is almost the reductive process which is the opposite of this additive process that we can find here. So in this additive process what we also see the way these figures have been made in which if we can get into the details we find there is a depiction of a female figure in here. Now how to read the images in terms of that we know there is this one particular term I would like to mention here and that is iconography in which we find that how to recognize an icon or an image or an idol. The formal characteristics to recognize these images that is something that is called iconography. Now in going with the iconographical features of this figure that we have in the left side of the screen we see there is this uh, female figure which has been uh, modeled and uh, we see that I mean the, the physical features of this figure in which like the eyes are also been added with this uh, two small uh, you know blobs of clay and then there is a thick uh, lips uh, the, a pair of lips those are also added to this face and then we also see the other body parts for example the hand which touches the waist and then of course the breasts and then the navel and so on. So we find that I mean how the female figure that had been uh, made here it, it follows the anatomical proportion as well as the different body parts that suggest that I mean this is not uh, gender neutral but I mean this is a female figure in. Now the other feature of this figure that we find it has this fan like huge headdress on the top of its head and in this headdress what we find that I mean it is not only just fan shaped but there are uh, flower like forms which are uh, made in series. And then we also have a choker like necklace which is, which is uh, covered around her neck and then we also have a hanging necklace that is there. And uh, also in the waist she also wears a waistband. So there seems to be an importance towards the ornaments that they have uh, used during this time. So the ornaments are done with much detail. So it also might have suggested that the use of the ornaments in this particular respect they might have also carried some cultural value thus the reason they have been done with much more detail and compared to uh, what we see in the body. And this is uh, and uh, for example this if this is one of the things that we find there from this, uh, this Indus Valley sites the other one will be in the right side of the screen for example this horse figurine. And the horse figurine as you can see that I mean there is a hand of a conservator which is holding the, the horse figurine that also gives us a sense of the size of it. It is pretty much small, it is very portable and this horse figurines they also we find that they, if we go with the iconograph graphical study that they follow this the basic shape of a horse uh, and then at the same time they also have the naturalistic execution of the different body parts. So the legs we find they have been simplified for the horse figurine to be stable and but at the same time if we see the back and also the suggestion of the ears, the eyes and the fur and so on those are the things that we find to be done with much naturalistic uh, detail. And so these are the things we have from this Indus Valley sites which are considered that either they were been made as part of some ritual or they can also be part of toys and the rituals there had been it is believed that there had been elaborate rituals for childbirth because the health 
conditions and all those other issues were a concern and uh, for, for that reason there had been rituals on childbirth and the health of the newborn child and so on. That is the reason we find that there have been many of these figures who are related to this fertility, you know, fertility related issues as well as that I mean there are many of these figures which go with the, with the theme of this of uh, betterment of life and sustainment of life. Thank you.